right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our webinar. I'm excited to uh, introduce our panel today. We're going to have a fun conversation. So today, this Farm Country update is about top topics with top producers. So I'm Sarah Schaefer, editor of Top Producer Magazine, and will serve as the host of this conversation. So before we kick off, um, a little information about Top Producer. So Top Producer is the business magazine for farmers. So we are connected to Farm Journal in that we both cover crops um, and technology, but Farm Top Producer really takes more of a business focus with it. And so we cover money, marketing, management, and really serve the CEOs of large and diversified farm operations. So to receive Top Producer, you have a, we have a minimum of 1,000 acres. So that's really that shift to when it becomes more of a business. And so one interesting fact about our audience is that we are 106,000 readers represent less than 15% of U.S. farms, but control 60% of U.S. Ac farm acres. So you kind of see the importance of this audience. So next, I wanted to share a little bit about our Top Producer Summit, which we just had in Nashville. All of our panelists were there, and we had a great time. And so this is our business and networking event for farmers. And so 2023 marked our 26th event of the Top Producer Summit. And so we really enjoy having this gathering that provides networking, education, entertainment, and then also lets us honor some really amazing farmers. So you'll see on the slide there just some of why the reasons farmers come to this event. Um, and again, one of our favorite things is being able to honor farmers with our awards programs. So before we dive into our discussion, I did want to share a little bit about our awards. So we have three different awards that we honor farmers with each year. Top Producer is our oldest award. It started in 2000, and we honor three finalists and then um, select one winner at our event. Our Horizon Award is our award for young farmers, so farmers 35 and under. And then our Ewa Trailblazer Award is one for a female farmer. And so I'm so excited because today we have a farmer from each of these awards here for our conversation. So as we um, switch over here to our um, speaker mode, um, throughout, the, um, throughout the webinar, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A box, and I'll be watching those. So I have some questions for them, um, but please, I want to see uh, what questions you all have, because these are, as you'll soon see, some really amazing farmers leading some really impressive operations. Um, it may be easiest to put the view in speaker mode, or in speaker view, um, so you can tell exactly who's talking. Um, and then if you have any issues with audio or anything, put it in the chat and Susan and I are here and we'll try to fix those. So with that, we'll get started with our conversation. So we have three farmers here, Marsha Ruff from Ohio, Kevin Ingle from Virginia, and Trey Wasserberger from Nebraska. Trey is with us. He's just having a little bit of a spotty internet, so uh, we'll still be able to visit with him. So let's start with a little background on each of these folks. So Marsha, I'm going to start with you. So Marsha was our EBA Trailblazer winner this year. So tell us a little bit about your farm in Ohio and your family. Our farm is uh, currently 4,000 acres and we raise corn, soybeans, and wheat. Uh, we also have uh, some beef cattle here on the farm. Um, it has kind of become an overgrown 4-H project. Uh, Mark and I have always had cattle, but as the kids get older and interested, they have more cattle than we do at this point, but uh, that's been a good good venture for them and, and something that's uh, real easy to get involved with them about. Uh, we also have a drainage tiling business, a lawn seating business. Um, we started here with my uh, oldest son doing an ear corn business selling on Amazon. And we have a container loading facility that has been built in the last year. So we're loading out containers currently. So we have a little bit of everything going on. Um, my husband and I have been married for 25 years and that's really when Rough Farms as we know it has started. Uh, we have three children. We have our oldest Matthew is in college at Ohio State, majoring in ag systems management at this point. Um, our 
younger son is uh, a sophomore, actively involved 4-H FFA. He's got his own uh, small lot of uh, feeder calves, going to sell those out for freezer beef. And my daughter is 11, and she's in fifth grade, uh, last year of elementary school for for the rough family. Uh, so uh, she's busy. She she's busy. I'm just going to say that she uh, she and she's in everything. She's the little sister that keeps up with everybody. But she's got her own interests. She's very much into. Last year she started vegetable and gardening and a pumpkin patch, and she's uh, interested in expanding that this year. So we're into we're into a lot of things. And Marcia, in addition to uh, co-owning and running Rough Farms, you are also a full-time teacher. So maybe share a little bit about that. Yes, I uh, teach here in the in the school district, which my kids attend. So that makes it nice. I'm on their schedule. Uh, so currently, I am a reading intervention specialist. I work with mostly kindergarten students, um, but when they're out doing their you know math and or their I'm sorry their music and. Uh, the other classes that they they do during the day, then I go down and work with third graders as well, but helping those students that just need a little extra support with reading. Um, and then I always say, you know, I slip in those agriculture topics whenever I can. So um, if I can teach them that my, my example is H makes the huh sound and H is for hen and the hen is the girl chicken that lays the eggs. That was the example I used earlier in my video, but uh, you know, whenever I can put those things in and you know, with teacher substitute shortage, occasionally I get pulled from my job to substitute for other teachers. Um, you know, if there's a sudden illness or something and uh, I make sure I have my stack of farm books with me and I make sure if I get a chance to read aloud, we read things like click clack moo and uh, other stories that um, I can work in those farm lessons about and uh, help those kids. We live in a rural community, so I try to educate them about what's going on around them. Great. Thank you, Marsha. All right, Kevin, tell us about your farm operation, Ingle Family Farms in Virginia. Well, we're mostly a grain farm. Uh, we grow corn and soybeans and wheat, milo, rapeseed. Uh, we farm about uh, 25,000 acres here spread out in Virginia quite a bit and a little bit in North Carolina, some of which is uh, irrigated land. A lot of it is river bottom land as well. There's just all kinds of different soil types. Um, we do our own uh, trucking for the most part, hauling our grain. Most of our grain comes into the grain facilities during harvest and is shipped back out post harvest. Uh, we, we do our own spraying and our own fertilizer application work and all of that. Uh, I'm blessed with, uh, my wife and I are blessed with, with three good children, adult children who all work in our business now and uh, very thankful for that here in Virginia. There's lots of opportunities for lots of different kinds of employment. So we're, we're thankful that they chose to stick around with us and, and help work here. And, uh, and grow the business and, and have a lot of the same shared interest. Uh, we have a very dedicated staff for the most part and uh, some folks have been with us for uh, years and we're thankful to have them. And we try to have a family atmosphere among, among our workers and let them know that we're all part of a, uh, a larger family here together and trying to accomplish what we accomplish. Um, serve a lot of the larger uh, buyers of grain here in Virginia. That uh, Virginia is a grain deficit state, so businesses like Smithfield Hogs and Purdue Poultry and whatnot uh, rely on us for a lot of just-in-time inventory when they're uh, struggling to get uh, shipments brought in to keep their feed mills rolling. So, lots of opportunities there and. That's that's a lot to keep it, you guess. busy. Yep. <laughs> yep. All right. Thanks, Kevin. All right, Trey. Um, tell us about so Trey is our livestock representative, mainly livestock representative on this call from North Platte, Nebraska. So Trey, tell us a little bit about um, TD Angus Ranch and uh, your family. Yeah, I'm uh, Trey Wasserver, TD Angus um, here in North Platte, Nebraska. I was raised in northern Wyoming, a small coal mining town called uh, Gillette, Wyoming, and uh, have a family there uh, that just celebrated their centennial, which 
probably out in Virginia is not a big deal. I'm sure some of those farms that Kevin farms are probably a lot older. I think he said he uh, farmed at, at George Washington's or something crazy like that. I mean, <laughs> it was like, yeah, I, don't know, I, I remember his speech. I thought that was awesome. But, um, you know, we, we, you know, we all come off the wagon here basically and settled because we weren't smart enough to stay back East, I guess. And, um, yeah, so my family just sent a, uh, celebrated their centennial 100-year ranch in Wyoming. Um, I went to the University of Wyoming. Actually, I had a teaching degree, so uh, Marsha liked uh, like that. I respect that uh, profession more than anything, and my wife does too. I met my wife, uh, Dana Wasserberger, there, and uh, we met in the education school there, and plans were to uh, teach and um, run some yearlings, you know, in Gillette, Wyoming, and coach, and uh didn't happen like that, I guess. And so we um, we moved down here to North Platte and just we, we met Bill Richel through a, through our mutual friend, our bank. And he had three daughters and, and they didn't come back. And he's a, a historic uh, Angus breeder. He's up for saddle and sirloin this year and um, bought the ranch in 2017. And things were tough and uh, never owned a registered cow and bought about 300 at that time. And now we're running about 1,200 in about four years. Uh, no one could have told me that they have heifers and those heifers have heifers and those heifers, heifers have heifers. And uh, so it accumulated pretty quick. And uh, yeah, we're one of the top 10 for breeders and registrations in the Ang Association and uh, first generation uh, purebred breeder. And um, we love what we do, getting ready for a bull sale here in a couple of weeks. Sell about 400 catalog bulls to about 30 states. and hopefully some overseas as well, some embryos and some semen as well. And, uh, yeah, baptism by fire. I guess uh, we started a small company here called Sustainable Beef LLC, which is a producer-owned packing plant. Um, it's taking us about three years to get it done, but it's right here in North Platte, Nebraska. And, um, it's going to employ about 800 people. And uh, gonna, yeah, it's just been a huge, you know, our community needs it. Um, and in the beef state, and so we figured out we need to manufacture what we grow, and that's corn and cattle, and, and uh, sustainable beef has really grown and reached a lot of places, you know, uh, you know, Wall Street Journal, Fox News, I mean, it's been a wild couple of years, just for some cowboy in Sand Hills, and um, we sold, uh, took on a partnership with Walmart as well, um, took about a year, and we they came out here, looked at our program, saw we're conception to consumer, um, really loved our story and our carbon footprint, which is actually net negative. We're figuring out, and uh, yeah, they it's uh, we're moving dirt, getting about four hundred loads in of dirt a day, pouring some concrete and some pylons, and we're we're really kicking ass there. We got about one hundred fifty pylons in, which is only about thirty four hundred left. Thirty four hundred are left, so we got a ways to go. But uh, yeah, it's been a fun journey, and I'm honored to be on the panel. So thanks for having me. Great, great. Well, I'm going to stick with you. Um, you queued us up well. I want to talk about diversification with all of you. And Trey, I think um, a lot of people assume it's hard to diversify in the cattle industry. And so obviously you have the sustainable beef project, but tell us, you know, how you decided that was the right direction and some other ways you're diversified. Yeah, I, I hear it all the time that young people can't get started in this business. And it's just not true. You just got to be uh, diversified and, um, you know, uh, sustainable beef innovation is created in hard times and innovation is created when you're really going through a grind and, and when you're, you have the ability to, to stay focused while hurting, um, that's when innovation kind of, kind of morphs itself. And I think, you know, we all go through tough times. I mean, inflation, interest, labor, uh, I don't think any of it's easier and it's not going anywhere and it's not going to get any easier, but we diversify when we're, we're, we're I'm not going to say we're forced to, but when we wake up in the morning, look in the mirror and say, this isn't working and I got to do something different. And, you know, I went through a pandemic and fat cat, uh, feeding cattle is not for the faint of heart at all. And um, it, it takes a lot of equity and a lot of capital and, and a lot of risk. And um, I drove down those alleys, you know, in, in June of 2020 and, July of 2020, almost for a year and, and couldn't, didn't have a home for those cattle to go anywhere. Nothing I could do about it. And I just realized that uh, we need to do something different and uh, we needed to change. And, you know, the most expensive things in agriculture is that's the way dad did it. And um, 
You know, if that's the way dad did it, I'd be teaching school in Wyoming. And that's just the truth of it. And so we had to adapt and evolve. And we're very, very, I, I love our company because we're very, very agile and very, very mobile. And I think that has to do with today's evolving times and markets. You know, I'm just looking over here and, and grains, you know, grains are all over the board and cattle's all over the board. And you know what, tomorrow might be the opposite. And so I think your company needs to be that way. And you just can't say, I'm going to set out to sell bulls. That's just not, uh, that's just, I just don't think that's healthy today. And, um, you know, I think my bank would agree. I sound like a banker right now, but that's the truth. And, uh, you know, diversification is what's going to pay the bills at the end of the day, if you evolve and, and become innovative. So. Great. Thanks, Trey. Um, Kevin, let's hop over to you. I think you might be one of the most uh, diversified farmers I know, just in all the new ideas that come and go. So talk a little bit about what some of those have been over the years and kind of how you how you approach what's a fit and what's not? Well, I guess to start with, it's just the diversification in land and soil types and geography. Uh, you know, we have a lot. Talk of about, Kevin, talk about how far your planting window is since you're so spread out. In. <laughs> <laughs> well, we we traditionally start on average, you know, somewhere around the last few days of March. Uh maybe the first of April, just depending on soil temperatures, but we'll, we'll be planting something all the way up to probably July the 10th or 12th. I mean, every day, you know, every day it's not raining, we'll be planting. And a lot of times we'll have to move completely out of one area into another area. And I mean, uh, just the different soil types and whatnot. We're, we're spread out east to west, 235 miles and north to south, 265 miles. So there's a lot of time spent on the road and, uh, you know, technology helps us keep up with what the weather patterns are in different areas and, and uh, which farms kind of maybe are too wet to, to operate on. And maybe we regroup and go to a different area that, that, you know, what's Mike Tyson say, every plan's a good plan to get punched in the mouth. Well, we, we have a plan that we start out with in the spring, but uh, seldom does it, uh, follow through all the way, you know, because weather, weather punches us in the mouth usually somewhere, but, um, so quite a bit of diversification there. And we, uh, you know, are able to have some good crops in some areas and other areas might, uh, uh not do so well, but hopefully on a, on year to year, it averages out. Uh, we diversify into different, uh, types of, crops within the crop, so to speak, like soybeans. We were growing beans for Benson Hill out of uh, St. Louis, Missouri, you know, all the way out here in Virginia, we're growing Benson Hill soybeans. Uh, we grow seed for uh, some of the different seed companies. Um, we grow some, occasionally we grow beans that get shipped to Japan for tofu and natto. Uh, we're growing white corn as well as yellow corn. Uh, yellow corn is used for of course, in the poultry and the swine and the beef and the dairy industries out here, we have, but also we grow some specialty yellow corns for the distillery industry. We're partners in a, in a bourbon distillery here in Charlottesville that uh, is, is growing and doing quite well and getting ready to introduce a new bourbon this month of March, uh, the Secretariat Racehorse brand bourbon. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, kicking off here in March. And we've got a lot of potential sales up for that already, uh, as well as some other distilleries that we supply. Um, we're doing some other things as well. My, my youngest son and some of his friends are in the Airbnb business, and we've taken a lot of the houses that we have around on the different farms and, and are getting them set up for, the, for, the, for that business and uh, just a lot of people traveling up and down the East Coast. It's kind of amazing to me how many people want to stop and rent your house for two or three or four or five days. You know, it's just, uh, it's pretty interesting. And it's interesting meeting those folks and uh, some of them you never meet, but that's okay too. Uh, then uh, we have, I guess, a little bit more of a higher end hunting that we're doing on some of our properties. We're, uh, 
you know, we, we kind of keep the, the number of hunters down, but the uh, 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 type of individual that would hunt our property is, is willing to pay pretty good and uh, try to do some things when we're harvesting our crops or planting our crops in the spring that enhance the desire of those folks to come hunt on our properties. And uh, I guess the, 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 the most recent thing that I, my youngest son was doing, I didn't know he was doing, uh, and is uh, this thing called Sniff Spot. And uh, Sarah, if, you, if you're traveling up and down Interstate 95, or you're living in Richmond or Fredericksburg or Washington, and you, you live in a condo and you have a dog or two dogs, you don't always have a good place to walk them and take them and go have fun. Well, uh, my son Casey, he has developed this, uh, worked with this uh, uh, app on the phone called the Sniff Spot, and people can look up where they are in the world and what sniff spots are available in their location. And they pay this app so much per dog per hour coming out to walk on your property and you outline the areas that they can walk and where they can go and where they're not supposed to go. And uh, he's taking in a pretty good little uh, amount of money doing that. I was, I was quite shocked. And uh, I, I like that because I like to preserve our land. This land out here is so historical. And uh, uh, I just, I love the history of, of it and I love the outdoor feelings of it. And so many of the folks in our area or on the East Coast don't get an opportunity to experience that so much. And uh, it's, it's kind of uh, fulfilling my heart to see those folks be able to, to experience coming out and walking around on a farm. So I appreciate the opportunity to tell you all some of these things. And, Hope you find them as fascinating as my family and I have. Hey, thanks, Kevin. All right, Marsha, you all have a lot going on. You're not just a standard corn and soybean farm in the Midwest. So talk a little bit about um, those many diversification elements that you all have in place. Uh, I'm going to piggyback on something Trey said. It's kind of like, you know, your diversification comes kind of out of a, a need or something that else that has happened. That is really how the tiling business came to be was we were going to need tile installed in some farms. The soil types that we have around here really just do well if you have some, some drainage going on. Um, but if you are going to contract that, I mean, waiting lists here are a year or two. It's just kind of crazy. So once you get kind of looking into some of those things, um, we looked at, well, what would it cost if we purchased our own equipment and started doing some things? And once you kind of figured the numbers, what the payback would be and in the increase in yields, it started to make some sense to invest in our own equipment, um, get, get some education, do some research, see what you can do and make it happen. And then once you start doing that, how, you know, how can you improve things for other people? So other people didn't want to wait on those waiting lists with other people, you know, with you know, your local agencies or your local contractors. So, you know, we've picked up some business um, for other people near and far. My husband has traveled out of state even because there's, you know, there was a farmer in West Virginia. He said, I can't get anybody. What can we do to make this work out? And, and they were able to do that. So most of it's in state, but he has traveled out of state to get that done as well. But that was something that helped us and decided to offer that to other people. And it's helping other people too. And, uh, you know, they're, they're reaping the benefits of, you know, better drain fields as well. So, um, you know, the lawn seeding business, that was something that got started years and years ago. They're again out of, out of a necessity of being able to do some things that we needed done, you know, waterways and things like that. And then, you know, once people moved out to the country, bought a five acre lot and then realized they didn't really wanna, didn't know what to do with it or how do I seed all of this, you know? They can take care of around their house, but what do I do with another five acres? So, you know, we were able to do that and then get into commercial things. There's, you know, shopping centers are built and they have all these little islands that need grass. Well, not everybody has that equipment. So we've been able to do some things like that. Local universities, we're doing some things for the uh, 
uh, Department of Natural Resources. Um, you know, when you have the equipment, people find out you have the equipment, and you can do things, they call you up. So, you know, that's kind of how the, some of those things started. Of course, that helps your, your uh, cash flow through the year as well. You know, um, I would say people that aren't in farming don't understand the paycheck doesn't come every two weeks. It's very seasonal. So when you have these other entities, it does help. So, um, you know, the, the ear corn business with my son, you know, that was a, uh, an idea that we had, decided to try it, borrowed a corn picker the first year that we decided to try this. And now my son owns a corn picker. He does not own a vehicle of his own, but he does own a corn picker. Um, but, uh, you know, that was a, that's a niche market. And, you know, when it comes time for him to pay college bills, that little niche market has helped, um, you know, have that money uh, saved up for that. So, and that's something he can continue. He's still the owner. He's at college, but younger brother is the daily manager now. So that's a chance for them to work together. Both of them continue a business um, and, you know, put a little money in their pockets and, and have that entrepreneurial spirit at a young age as well. Um, so the container loading business, you know, that's, uh, something new. We were approached by a business that wanted something in the area and they again did our research, got to looking at it and decided to, to go with it. And, uh, you know, it's up and running now. So, um, just doing things a little differently. I uh, think somebody said, maybe it was Trey, I don't know about, you can't farm like your, your dad did. Or, you know, you, you've got to do it differently. And uh, we just try to keep that, that, uh, those thoughts ahead. What, what could be different? What could be the next thing? How can you diversify? How can you make it different? How can you make it a specialty um, to just keep things moving forward? Thanks, Marcia. Let's talk a little bit about challenges. You know, as you think of this upcoming season, what, um, what's one of the top challenges that you're worried about or that's keeping you up at night? So Trey, you want to kick us off with that one? What challenges um, are, are the, the top of your list right now? Oh, yeah. I mean, every, name something that we touched today in agriculture that hasn't gone up in price. I mean, uh, it doesn't. And that's, you know, so this is crazy to even think of. But I sold fat cattle this morning for more money than I ever had in my entire life. They lost money. Um, I mean, you want to talk about it's hard. It's hard enough to just get the, you know, stay in, to grow. It's But it's even harder this year just to stay in front of the note. And it's hard to be out there. It's hard to look at my children and be like, I'm out there selling fat cattle for $1.67. And they're not, that's not working. And I mean, how do you tell, how do we retain talent in our rural communities when dollar wise, it's not working in the late, there's no doubt about it. I mean, none of us would be here if it wasn't for the passion uh, that we love. I love this. I love what I do. And even though it doesn't work all the time and, and that's okay, but that gets fewer and fewer every day. And I, I go and talk to a lot of, uh, you know, entrepreneurial programs in the universities between the University of Nebraska and the University of Wyoming. And, and, you know, all these young children, young men and women, I should say, how do I get started in this business? And, and that's getting harder and harder and harder to explain. And I mean, I'm going to be very, very humble and upfront about this. A lot of it is timing and luck. And I mean, you know, I, I can work myself out of a wreck, but I, it's sure a lot easier when I'm lucky. And, but the harder I work, the luckier I get. And I tell, tell these, you know, young entrepreneurs that if you guys want to do this, uh, you better love it first and you better be passionate about it. And then the rest seems to kind of fall in place. I was listening to a podcast this morning, actually, it was an Elon Musk, you know, the richest man in the world and highly successful entrepreneur. And they said, there, Joe Rogan's like, why do you want to go to the Mars? Why do you want to do this? You know, there's no monetary value for it for you today. I mean, this is a generational change. This talk, you know, this resonated with me with sustainable beef. My children will see the benefits of this more than I will. And he said, well, they're like, why are you spending a billion dollars to go to go to Mars? And Elon Musk said, well, because I'm passionate about it. And even though the odds of success are against me and probability of success are against me, if it's important enough to you, you'll work hard enough to see it through. And 
I think that's a, a, a secret to life today. Like, there's no doubt Big Ag is getting bigger. And, um, you know, we're, we're having trouble retaining young talent to come back to, to the farm and the ranch. And, um, but if we do, you know, we just got to make sure they love it. And if they do, they will see it through and continue to, you know, to do it. So you don't want to do it the way dad did it, but we all want our son to do what dad does. Right. I mean, that's two, that's, that's a, it's a catch 22. Yeah. There's nothing more than I want my children to show up like Kevin and, and three of them say, I want to be a part of this. But we all know that the way dad did it in the 80s didn't work. And so we just got to find the happy medium between there. And that's what keeps me up at night. How how do we stay in front of the note? How do we retain young talent? How do we cherish rural life and, and communities and continue this livelihood that it means so much to us? That's that's what keeps me up at night. So Great. Thank you, Trey. Um, Marsha, what about you? We'll go to you next. Biggest challenges right now. Oh, I think it's just how do you be ready for the changes that come? Because we see changes all the time and what's the next change that's going to come and are you going to be ready for it? How do you be ready for it? Um, you know, in the next few years, you may have the next turnover of farmers that decide to either get out of the business or retire. As much as a farmer retires, they have a hard time doing that. But, you know, there may be more you know, crop acres that come available, more opportunities. And then how do you position yourself to be ready for that when the farm that you've wanted for a while that becomes available? How do you have the finances ready to go when that happens to put the bid in, to rent it, to buy it, to whatever is there? So just always that planning of this is what we're doing and this is what we're doing for this year, but how do we plan for the next few years out? to be ready when those opportunities knock on your door because they only knock once and sometimes they only knock softly and you got to be ready for it so how do you be ready for those things and and have have your ace in the hole and ready to go thank you kevin biggest challenge right now well i, I just uh I, I echo the thoughts of both marcia and trey i mean it's it's challenging staying ahead of the expenses and the increased costs and uh, like Trey said, and it's, it's also uh, challenging being ready as Marsha was describing and trying to figure out what the next black swan event is going to be, you know, trying to predict that because those are the things that can hurt you. Uh, it's, it's, it's really hard to be prepared for when you get punched in the mouth, you know, <laughs> And uh, uh, the best way to do that is just have a good management team with you to bounce ideas off of, having people, you know, kind of like a board of directors, so to speak, uh, within your business that's paying attention to, to uh, the industry and what's going on and, and trying to predict the, the good things to follow through through and, and, and the potential black swans and they don't just have to be in your business either i mean they can be people that just love agriculture and are respected and knowledgeable and and uh sometimes uh have a little extra gray hair uh you know where they've seen some ups and downs and some cycles and can help you uh decide how to be better prepared so uh that's good and then on the flip side of that the opportunities in agriculture continue to get bigger and bigger and come faster and faster. And uh, trying to decide when you're so, when you have so much passion for this business, trying to decide which ones to follow through with and which ones to leave alone is tough because uh, you can't do them all. You know, if you try to do them all, you're not going to be good at any of them. But, uh, Trying, trying to zero in on the targets that would have the most possibility and probability to work in your operation is a challenge. So. Well, Kevin, we'll stay with you. We got a couple questions coming in. Um, someone would like, could you expand a little bit about the rapeseed and canola that you're growing? Kind of what what is that used for? What role is that playing in your farm? Well, to, to start with, uh, I don't grow canola. I only grow the rapeseed, 
Uh, they look identical. The seeds look identical. The crop looks identical growing and all of that. Uh, but from what I understand, canola will kill a chicken dead right now. Okay. And we're contracting to grow the rapeseed for uh, Purdue Farms, which, you know, is using it in there for, for protein meal. They're crushing it for protein meal for their chickens. And then, of course, they extrude the oil and sell the oil on the, on the uh, soy oil and, and market, you know, that type of market. Um, but we, we like it because it's you're basically we can double crop beans behind wheat and this rapeseed basically grows in the same time frame that uh, wheat does so and we harvest it and everything in the same time frame so we can double crop beans behind it so you're basically producing two protein and oil crops from an acre of ground in one year can't do that year after year after year you've got to get in a cycle. Rapeseed has to be planted a little earlier than uh, in our area. It must be planted by the end of September to do well and harvested in June, of course. So uh, we've got a lot to learn about it. We've been doing it about uh, four or five years now and uh, we've had some successes and we've had some uh, I'm not going to call them failures, but some opportunities to learn and improve. Uh, and, uh, and we had a little wildlife destruction one year too. We have to factor that in. Um, but uh, I think it's got a lot of potential in our area. We just look forward to learning more and becoming a better grower of it for our uh, customer, which is Purdue at this point. Great. Thanks, Kevin. We have another question for all of you guys. So um, it's about carbon credits, just in terms of, do you all see that as an opportunity or are you, uh, I guess you can share if you've enrolled in any, but then also if you worry that the requirements might be too burdensome. So Trey, I'll start with you, um, kind of where, where are you at in the carbon journey? Yeah, two years ago, I didn't even know what carbon sequestration carbon sequestration was or how to spell it and today I am attending all kinds of meetings about uh, scrubbers and digesters and you name it we're actually our plan is going to be almost uh, it's going to have scrubbers and digesters probably it's looking like which you know we're going to trap all the all the methane and CO2 coming off the plant and then power it back and then it's going to be run on uh, solar panels you know the digester will be then another deal, we're using, working with Bion, Bion Enviro Environmental Technologies, which they are developing an indoor feedlot that captures all the carbon and all the phosphorus and all the CO2 um, with screeders underneath the cattle. And then we actually power it back um, with, with that sequestration. And then we can actually, this is crazy to me, but it not only uh, regenerates water, but it actually creates it. And if anything in the conversation out West is today is, is water usage. And it, without it, it, you know, Nebraska is good for th two things, and that is feed and water. And, um, and we need to protect it and uh, most ability. And you know what? More importantly, our consumer wants to talk about it. And uh, that's something that's very, very important uh, to them. And they want to know that we're taking care of our environment and we're taking care of our community and, Carbon sequestration, in my opinion, is not going anywhere and probably going to get bigger and you better know how to trace it and verify it. And so we are, and we want to be in front of that. We want to be a carbon net negative uh, closed supply chain conception to consumer model. So that's our goal. I don't know what that looks like in five years or 10 years, but I think it's, it's a part of the conversation now and it's what our consumer wants to talk about. Thank you. Marcia, anything to add in on the carbon conversation? No, but I find what Trey's saying very interesting. I'd probably like to talk with him a little bit more about that. Um, my husband's probably the one that uh, it'd be a great conversation for all of us if I bring him into that. Um, he has done a lot more research and things into that, but uh, I, I'd be more interested to see what other farmers are doing versus what you read, what you should do. I want to know what other farmers are doing and how they're getting it done. Kevin, we've been looking at 
carbon markets? We have, and uh, I, I just want to say to Trey, uh, I think it's in the in our emphasis infancy as far as developing uh, as a whole for what it can do for agriculture. Uh, but I'm with him. I, I can spell carbon pretty good, but I, I still can't spell sequestration and or barely say it. Uh, I'm not not a very good speller. But we have enrolled in uh, carbon programs, and uh, you know a lot of the things that we need to do to be in those programs are things that we need to be doing for mil multiple reasons here in our area in the country, uh, just to protect our environment and and maintain it and make it better for the future. And I guess that's one of the things that I would say keeps me up at night is, am I doing this land good? You know, am I making it better for tomorrow than it was today or yesterday? And that, that's important to, to, to our farming operation. Something that I pray for every day is that we do a good job and, and make sure we're creating something that's, that's better for the future and carbon sequestration can get us there. One of the tools in our toolbox to help us get there. And uh, I look forward to its development. And I think it's gonna be a, ultimately, I think it's gonna be a, a good profit center for, uh, for agriculture. And that's, uh, we can use all those we need, we can get. Great, thank you. So keep the questions coming in. I just have a few more. Um, so please drop any in the Q&A. Um, let's talk about employee management. All of you all have um, varying sizes of teams, but you've already talked about how important it is. Um, those team members are to your operation. So Marsha, I'll start with you. What are some ways that you are focusing in on employee management and retention and attraction, kind of depending on where you are on that uh, spectrum? That is a hot topic right now is employees and managing uh, labor. I think, you know, any industry right now is having those, those issues. Um, so we have actually had a little bit of turnover this year. And usually the turnover on our farm, it has to do with life events. Somebody got married, they're moving away somewhere else. Uh, they've had children decide they need to have, you know, different hours or things like that. And so that's usually been what it is. Uh, somebody that left recently, they are at an age when they want different hours. They want, you know, um, a, a dedicated uh, uh, kind of a retirement plan. <laughs> you know, we offer those things, but some agencies you can't compete with and what they can offer. So uh, we've had some turnover uh, lately, but uh, it's been interesting where the people have come from. Uh, we we've, we've tried the uh, online things, Indeed, and things like that, putting ads out. Um, my husband posted on a farmer's forum, and that is actually where we got uh, the best responses was people that were looking to work in the industry, either because they want to start on their own eventually, or they grew up in the industry and they want to be part of it. Uh, so we've got a a, young, a new newer crew coming in that we are training, and it's kind of as hard as it is to do a big transition, it's kind of nice too that you kind of started with a clean slate on several avenues there and can kind of create the culture that you want and train everybody from the get-go and hiring people for who they are, not always for what they know because you can train people to do a lot of things, but hiring people for who they are is become very evident that that's really become beneficial over the years to hire good people and then teach them the things that they need to know. And uh, so we have done some things recently. Uh, we met with Mark Faust at the Top Producer Summit and we have already had a training session with him. He came out and facilitated a whole day of professional development for our staff. And then he's going to come back uh, in a few months and do a follow up. And that was a great team building exercise. They all got to know each other. They got to know us better. What are our goals for the operation? Uh, what does it mean? So we do try to have that family environment as well. I think Kevin uh, mentioned that about his operation, having that family environment. Um, you know, they come to work. We live 
you know, 50 yards from <laughs> every, where everybody parks when they come to work in the morning. So, you know, it's not unusual for them to wave at our daughter waiting for the bus um, or they know wait five minutes to pull out of the driveway with a semi because the bus is coming. <laughs> so we don't tie up the little country road here. Um, you know, having that family environment, having uh, a, a place where we can have meetings and the, the guys, the crew can sit down and have meals together, uh, get to know each other, work together interchangeably. So the uh, really just trying to build that team and that's a constant thing. So, you know, and it, and it goes through the years. We've been doing this 25 years. We started out with really one full-time employee and now we have multiples and then we have a few part-timers. Uh, we've been very blessed with that. And we have some people that they have evenings and weekends free and they have a CDL and they like to drive trucks for us during harvest. So that's great to have those people on standby and maybe give one of our regulars a night off here and there. Or if we are blessed with a great harvest and we have a lot of semis rolling because it just keeps filling up. We have that extra driver. It's, it's really been great for that. Uh, my husband was an ag teacher years and years and years ago. Uh, and ironically, one of his former students now works for us in the off seasons of his other job that he does. Uh, so it's been kind of a great circle that came around. Um, but they're getting, creating that family environment. You know, he had the familiarity with us. Um, you know, he came back later and, you know, I have these, these odd times of year off. Could I could do, do some things? And yes, absolutely. He could. He's got a background in concrete. And we, of course, built that container business and we needed, we, built, we poured a lot of concrete. So having somebody that does that and had some advice for us, that was great to have. Uh, we have somebody works in our office um, who I, I will say office manager for lack of a better term. She does way more than that. Uh, she does way more than, you know, pay the bills. She does a lot of stuff. <laughs> Handily, I mean, she takes phone calls. She makes phone calls. She uh, helps with getting contracts signed. Um, she just does a lot of things for us. But that has been essential. We tried to get by um, in the early years. You know, we would pay our own bills and we would do our own billing. And then we had somebody for a few hours a week in the office. And then we had somebody a few more hours a week in the office. And finally, we just had to say, we need somebody here all the time, every day to keep on top of these things. And uh, that, has, that has been a really great move for us. I think she has made us more money because she keeps on top of everything. And, you know, things are just just keep moving all the time because of that. So uh, sometimes it's hard to take that uh, initiative to go ahead and pay that money for that full-time another employee, but what she saves us is well worth it. Uh, so, um, you know, we just, we just keep working all the time to, to make our, make our team better. Great. Kevin, talk a little bit about that family atmosphere with your employees and how you create that. Well, Marsha touched on a lot of neat stuff, and I think a lot of the things that we do are, are very similar. Uh, we did just get done building a building beside our house that uh, we can have farm tr uh, employee training events, you know, like when it's time to plant, we're going to bring in the guys that are doing the planting and, and maybe have a, uh, a, a program to just to sharpen up the skills and that type of thing and have a little lunch. Same thing with uh, uh, spraying, uh, you know, crop protection work, fertilizer spreading work, that type of thing. Uh, training with new equipment that we get. Uh, we can do those kinds of things there. Um, we have it kind of high tech where it can, people can come in and make presentations and, and do well. Uh, same thing with the harvest crew. We plan to do that there as, as well. But it's also nice to uh, just to be able to do things for the community with that building. You know, people ask me, you know, they'll come there, they'll be at a function and they'll say, well, uh, do you rent this out? You know, we'd like to rent it. And I'm like, well, no, we don't, we don't rent it out. And, oh, well, you should consider that. And I said, well, we have, you know, and uh, well, it sure would be a nice place to have such and such. And I'm like, well, why don't you have it here? 
<laughs> you know, and they're like, well, but you don't rent it. I said, that's right. Just please come have your event here. And it's just gave us great joy to, to see that. And, you know, some of our employees are feeling comfortable enough now that if they've got a wedding or an anniversary party or whatever, that they feel comfortable, you know, coming and, and having it there. And that's just great. I mean, it gives us a lot of joy to see that. Um, we also, uh, um, uh, have tried to be a little more, um, uh, aggressive, I guess, than we used to be on salaries and especially bonuses and try to tie the bonus to the performance of the farm. Um, uh, farm does well. I tell them all the time, that the, we're all in this together. The farm does well, you're going to do well. I want you to do well farm doesn't do well, you know, you're going to suffer with me a little bit. Uh, so uh, we've, we've, some of our main key employees, we've actually tied acres of production to their bonuses. So when we average what our crop yields are across the board and what we get for them, you know, they're assigned so many acres of income from it. So it's important makes it important to them to make crops do the best they can. So that's Great, thank you, Kevin. Been helpful. Yeah. All right, Trey, what about uh, with your employees? How are you attracting and retaining? Yeah, um, today it's, I've never seen it tougher. I mean, ev everywhere I go, uh, and especially bull customers and, and, and the feed yard and uh, labor is a huge issue. And, and once again, it's not going anywhere until this, administration gets these people back to work um that's just the way it's going to be and uh you know I, I like to recruit heavily we don't actively uh advertise for jobs um we just recruit hard and uh we we go and use use a lot of small junior colleges we we uh venture out quite a bit to the west and we really just try to preach to these young guys and women if this is something you want to be a part of we're going to take care of it and uh, we, we want retention and we want uh, longevity and commitment. Um, we let guys run cows, you know, registered cows. We had a guy guy uh, sell $50,000 bull last year. And he, you know, it was awesome. I got to write him a check for it. Congratulations. And, and you know what? The help saw that. And the young help looked around and said, man, I want to do that someday. And so my grandpa is terrible and he's gruff. But he said, you know, it's hard to find help. So we better start raising it, you know, like a true, like a true Irish Catholic. I mean, and I'm like, well, I don't know if it's that easy, Grandpa. And, and uh, but he's right. I mean, uh, trying to find find a, a big animal veterinarian today is incre It's incredibly tough. Uh, you know, I don't know what the answer to all this is, but our family monage is take care of them, give them a good place to live, uh, put you know, you know, support their children and their activities and. And allow them to go uh, be active in, in the community. And, and, and we promote that extensively. We want you to coach your children. Uh, we want you, your, your child to um, you know, be a part of the theater and dance team. And, and we want you there in the seats. And, it's, and we leave it up to them. We say, hey, if you got a soccer game at five and you got plenty to do, you know what you need to do. If you, don't need, to, if you need to start earlier or, or miss lunch to get it done so you can be there, we, we promote that. And, uh, you know, with the packing plant, sustainable beef, I've, I've really uh, fought hard with um, housing and getting a, a place for, you know, quality housing brings quality employees. And I've learned a lot from the Walmart beef team in that. I mean, you could be a, you could go drive a truck for Walmart and make $100,000 today. Uh, that's unprecedented and unheard of. But, you know, like Kevin said, uh, you know, putting it on the success of the program, if, if you pull the wagon and lean into the harness every day for us, we're going to take care of it and we're going to take care of you. And that's how we've always told our customers, if this works and you work for us, we're going to make this work your time. And uh, so people always ask me, how are you going to staff 800 people in this packing plant? And my answer to them is we're going to take care of them uh, like we always have. And uh, that keeps me up at night, but uh, it keeps me going forward too. So. I think that's uh, a great note to end it on. Um, thank you guys so much uh, for 
letting us pick your brains and for answering all these questions and just uh, for all that you do for the agriculture industry as well. So thank you for all the attendees for being here. Um, I shared the link where you can learn more about their operations and you'll get to read more about them in uh, future issues of Top Producer. But we wish everyone a safe and bountiful and warm, maybe an early spring. Um, so to that, we'll uh, close this out. And again, thank you everyone for attending. Thank you. Enjoy Thank it. you. Bye-bye.